carry on. Um, as I say, it's a bit of a momentous occasion here, and Edinburgh is um, very busy at the moment. So I think it's it's um, right that we pause for a, for a minute. Um, and I just want to read out this um, message here that um, the Council of the Society um, wanted us to, to, to put out. So um, let's just take a pause for this for a moment. Uh, we meet this evening in Edinburgh with the eyes of the world on Scotland and in the shadow of a momentous and historic event. For the death of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II yesterday, on the 8th of September, 2022, a page of history has turned right before our eyes. This society was founded in October 1924, so it's just 18 months older than Queen Elizabeth, who was born in April 1926. I think this fact alone helps us to appreciate how long the Queen has been part of our national life. We are honoured that the Astronomer Royal for Scotland is one of our honorary presidents, so the Council of the Society felt that it was fitting in the circumstances that we mark this sombre occasion by acknowledging the decades of duty and service Queen Elizabeth gave to the people of Scotland, the United Kingdom and across the Commonwealth. On behalf of the Society, we offer our sincere condolences to His Majesty the King and the members of the Royal Family. Okay, thank you. Okay, this is what we've um, got coming up tonight. Um, a few introductory remarks for myself, a bit of news. Um, uh, what we've got coming up um, soon in the next few months. And then the main event of the evening, we have Peter Goodhue here um, telling us about discovering and imaging planetary nebulae. And um, Sarah Bullman will be giving us the sky in September. She'll be doing that remotely. And then um, I was going to say we have tea and coffee others, but we don't tonight. That's <laughs> fine. <laughs> You can go outside and get some, I suppose. Um, one bit of news I haven't written down here. Um, there's a, a, a partial eclipse of the sun on the 25th of uh, October, um, about 10 o'clock in the morning. And we are hoping, in fact, we're pretty sure we're going to be back on Carlton Hill using the Cook Historic Telescope up there. Um, we'll be live streaming um, the partial eclipse um, from there. We can't all get up into the dome, there'll be a couple of us operating it. But what we will be doing is we'll be having our solar telescopes outside the dome. So anyone who wants to visit us up there, and anyone here who wants to help us, we'd be very grateful for help. Um, so if you want to come and look at the eclipse through the, through the telescopes, that would be great. Or it'll be live on uh, YouTube, on our YouTube channel as well. But the more, more news about that uh, coming out, so keep an eye on our website. Um, welcome to our latest new members. We have Leonid, um, Katie, and Ian. I don't know if any of them are here tonight, uh, but let's welcome um, our new members. And of course, as always, welcome to all visitors. You're, you're always welcome. There's no need to join our society. We're happy to have visitors um, along uh, as, um, as often as you like. Having said that, it's quite cheap to join and you get a lot of benefits as well. And those are the prices. And our membership is now 179, which is the highest it's ever been in our almost 100 year history. So um, things are going pretty well. There are lots of ways of staying in touch with the society. That's our website. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and you can see a load of amazing um, talks on our YouTube channel for people who've been speaking to us over the last um, three years probably now. Um, so definitely worth having a troll around that. Uh, some really good talks there. This is what we've got coming up over the next uh, few months. Um, our next talk on the 16th of September is an online only talk. Um, and that's from Dennis Vida about the Global Media Network. Um, a few of us in the society have media cameras that are attached to this. And it's, it's quite a, a, an amazing network of, of automated cameras capturing um, amazing number of meters all, all around the world and um, doing some amazing, amazing science. Um, our first meeting in October, the 7th of October, will be here again in the AUC in the United, Augustine United Church and also online as well. And that's about the ground effects of space weather from Gemma Richardson. On the 12th of October, we have our imaging and observing group. And that's um, for members only. Um, we have that online on Zoom. And this time we'll have a special guest um, talking to us, Paul Heron, talking to us about radio astronomy. The 21st of October, another online only talk is uh, from Greg Smy Romsby, and that's about space art, art and its influence on our understanding of the cosmos. So that's something a little bit different. Uh, we like quite a, have quite a mix of, of talks and subjects, and that, that should be quite an interesting one. 
We have lots of other um, talks lined up, but um, I haven't put them down here. Do, uh, on the 18th of November, we have another one lined up, which is about what makes a planet habitable from life on Earth to extrasolar planets. Um, keep an eye on our website. Um, we publish a lot of stuff on Eventbrite as well. And just you can get reminders from that. And we put most of our talks on YouTube afterwards if you happen to miss them. And it's over to Peter now. Um, that image is by our own Ian Smith of Abel 31. He won the image of the quarter award with that one, the Planetary Nebula. But I'm sure Peter will tell us lots more about these things. Okay, thank you. Oops. Okay, and um, thank you for inviting me. Um, if I knock this up. We should have something on screen. Excellent. Okay. Um, yes. Uh, every month, I experience the thrill of seeing something in the cosmos that no other human has ever seen. And that happens because I'm part of a, an international team that is searching for planetary nebulae. Um, it's an, significant in that with the exception of one professional astronomer, we are all amateurs. And yet um, in recent years, we've discovered hundreds of planetary nebulae and continue to do so. Um, my role is to take photographs where we think there might be a planetary nebula. Uh, sometimes there is one, sometimes rarely there's nothing. Uh, sometimes it's not a planetary nebula at all, but um, something else that's surprising could be a supernova remnant. And in some cases, it's something we just don't know what it is. Uh, but when I start taking the photograph, I have no idea what's going to appear. Um, and then as more data comes down from the telescopes, uh, the image appears in front of my eyes. And that's quite a magical moment. Um, so what I'd like to do is to talk about how, how we do that. But first, it's important to get some of the basics about planetary nebula understood and some basic, some basic elements of the physics of planetary nebulae. One of the first questions I get asked is, why do we call them planetary nebulae when they're not planetary? In fact, they've got nothing to do with planets. Um, now, it all started um, in, um, when Charles Messier in 1774 produced his famous catalogue. He didn't know it, but the catalogue contained four planetary nebulae. And those were the first, earliest recorded observations of, of planetary nebulae. Um, he wasn't particularly interested in them. He was interested in, in, in uh, finding comets. And these were things which didn't move, and obviously weren't comets. So the catalogue was designed to, uh, put, to list things that you want to avoid. Um, six years later, um, uh, our, our friend William Herschel um, he uh, discovered the first one. Now, what happened was it was, um, well, in 1781, uh, he discovered Uranus. And it was about 12 months after that, he was in his garden, looking through his telescope, uh, in looking at the constellation Aquarius. And he found something very, very strange. He didn't really know what it was. Um, fortunately, we've got all of the... Um, notes that he took in the archives of the Royal Astronomical Society. So I dug out the, um, his notes from that night and I'll, I'll show you what he, he wrote. Um, he said, a curious nebula or comet. Um, this is, um, this is um, at what, half past nine in the evening. Curious nebula or comet. He went on, went on to describe it as a little oval. Um, Later that night, he went back to it. And I haven't got the, the notes from later in the night. And he noticed it hadn't moved at all. So he discounted the fact that it was a comet. But what's also significant, um, he didn't describe it as a planetary nebula, although it was actually the first planetary nebula that he recorded an observation of. Um, he, um, I tried to find out or, or simulate how it would have looked for him. Um, and so this is what I think it would have looked like visually through his telescope with you know, limited resolution. And we can see that, yes, it is oval. Um, but this is actually a, a, a blurred image that I took, a more detailed image. And the, the actual target 
is NGC 7009. And we can see it in more detail. It's obviously, um, well, actually, you might consider that to be a planet. It looks, it is known as the Saturn Nebula. So that could have caused even more confusion. Um, but it's only later when he started publishing his catalogues that he used the term planetary nebula. Um, and it was, um, we can see in, in one of the three catalogues he published, he's got a subcategory in the catalog, which is planetary nebulae. And this is the first known use of that term planetary nebulae. Um, and I think he was using it because it was a nebula that looked like a planet. In fact, it bore quite a significant resemblance in color to Uranus. Um, now, uh, today, he didn't know what planetary nebulae were then. He just, it was a category of things that looked blobs that were a bit like a planet, but fuzzy and, um, and fairly bright. And um, that was the only, there was no scientific basis behind his classification. So he didn't know what we now know to be a planetary nebula. Um, the problem is that although we do now understand them quite well, uh, that term planetary nebulae or planetary nebula has persisted. So we still call them planetary nebulae, even though they're not planetary in the slightest. And I, I guess we always will do. Um, okay, so what is a planetary nebula? Um, what are they? Uh, all stars eventually reach the end of their life. What happens when, uh, take our sun, for example, it's stable at the moment because uh, there's a balance between the gravitational pressures trying to compress it and the radiation pressures from the nuclear reaction that's going on inside. And these balance themselves out. And as long as the stars got fuel, it will stay fairly stable like that. But eventually the hydrogen fuel runs out, gravity takes over and the star collapses. Now, if the star is more than eight times the mass of our sun, the, next, the result of that is a supernova. If the star is less than eight times the mass of our sun, um, what happens is there was a collapse, and then the outer shell of the star is ejected. And that reveals a very, very hot white dwarf that's left behind. Um, so hot it could be 100 times hotter than our sun, but very, very, very small. And that white dwarf emits intense ultraviolet radiation. And that radiation then ionizes the shell that's been ejected. And in particular, uh, there'll be hydrogen there. And that when that's ionized, it emits light at, in a, a red part, a wavelength in the red part of the spectrum. And there will also be oxygen, and that oxygen will emit light in the sort of blue green part of the spectrum. And that's the light that we see from a planetary nebula. It's, it's this gas cloud around a star that's in its death throes. Um, what's interesting about them, or well, one thing that's interesting, is that um, they're very short-lived. Uh, astronomically, they will live for between, typically between five and 25,000 years, compared with billions of years for the lifetime of a star. Um, having said that, uh, there was a paper published this week which uh, describes what we think is the oldest planetary nebula, which is 75,000 years old. Um, and I'm doing some work on that at the moment. Now, I like planetary nebulae because they're pretty, they're colorful. They're colorful because you get the red from the hydrogen, you get the blue green from the oxygen, but you also get very, very interesting shapes and morphologies. Um, some of them uh, are, about 20% of them tend to be appear spherical and round. Um, and here, for examples, if you look very closely and you've got very good eyesight, you might, might make out a tiny blue star in the center of these. And that is the white dwarf, which is emitting ultraviolet radiation. Um, and those are, yes. So 20% or thereabouts are round. Most are more irregular than that. Um, here are some examples of more irregular ones. And so we get all sorts of strange shapes um, and colors. And uh, the, the reasons for that um, are not fully understood, but uh, there are many, many different um, elements which we think do influence the shape of that gas cloud. If there's something there to disturb it, it will influence the shape. For example, um, you get very strong magnet magnetic fields. Uh, you get a lot of binary star systems where the gravitational effect of a binary star will disturb it. You can get even very large planets that are close to the star. They will have an effect. Um, you can also have um, um, 
interstellar medium, which the shell will collide with as it, as it expands. So all sorts of different factors um, will explain why you get these unusual shapes. Um, one other thing is that that white dwarf, after the initial um, sending out the shell, it fades. And as the shell goes out, and it goes out at a fairly high spe speed, 35 kilometers a second, it gets bigger and it gets more dis dis um, dispersed. So those two factors mean that as the planetary nebula evolves, it becomes fainter very, very quickly. And eventually after you know, 5,000 5, or 25,000 years, it's so faint we can't detect it anymore. And it just merges into the interstellar, interstellar medium. Okay, um, time for a drink. Now, um, over the past 10 years in particular, amateurs have been making tremendous contribution to science in discovering these. Um, they've discovered literally hundreds. And um, unlike uh, Messier and uh, Herschel, they don't discover them by looking through telescopes. There's no point looking through a telescope. These are too faint. If, if they were bright enough to be seen, we'd have found about we'd have found them by now. So they will, um, they're all too faint to see. And some of the researchers that help uh, are part of the team, they don't even have a telescope. And they certainly don't look through one to, to make any discoveries. Um, what they, they do is that they use um, surveys that have been done by professional telescopes. Some are ground-based, some are space-based. But and they, 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 these are surveys that have been done of large areas of the sky. They've been done at various wavelengths. Um, common one is, is in hydrogen alpha, others would be red, green, blue. Some will be in the um, ultraviolet, some will be in the infrared. And so you can look at these and you can, you can search them and you can, you, you can look to see telltale markers of where there might be a planetary nebula. Um, typical marker might be just a cloud of something, gas, dust, um, which is sort of distinct from the, the background. Uh, another might be a, um, a very bright, hot, white dwarf star. And if you find the two together, then there's a good chance that you might have a planetary nebula there. Um, so what happens is that researchers, and I don't do this, but others do, they spend hours and hours and hours pouring over all of these surveys, looking for signs where there might be a planetary nebula. Um, so how do I get into this? Well, when they have found something, they then need a photographer, a friendly photographer, spend hours photographing it. And it has to be photographed from a dark sky site. It has to be photographed when there's no moon, because otherwise it, there's too much light. And it has to be photographed for quite a long time. Uh, typically, this would take between 30 to 50 hours of imaging. Um, uh, we recently did one which took 190 hours. Um, so that gives you an indication of, of how faint they are. Um, and it's not that easy to find people with good telescopes at dark sites, happy to spend hundreds and hundreds of hours doing this for free. But I was doing it for free. Um, initially, I was um, just imaging faint planetary nebula myself. But um, I got very, very popular when people discovered that you know, they wanted to you know, do some research imaging. So yeah, how did I get into this? Well, originally, um, I live in West London. Um, I live under the Northern Runway Approach Pass to Heathrow Airport. Uh, it's a bottle seven sky. I have tall trees and tall buildings all around me. So it's probably the most insane place in the world to try to do deep space, you know, deep sky photography. Um, and it took me a few years to realize that. And when I did, I decided I had to do something about it. And I, um, I set up a remote robotic telescope in Spain. And first time I did this was about five years ago. And then three years ago, I expanded my capability and had, and had a, a twin rig of uh, scopes, and, uh, which I can control from my home. And so they're totally automatic or automated. And, uh, and also, uh, they've got f high speed fiber optic con uh, connections there. So all of, each time the cameras take a photograph is automatically downloaded to this laptop 
sitting in my lounge. Um, so when I wake up in the morning and I pull my cup, cup of coffee, I've got a whole night's imaging waiting for me, which is quite is much better than standing in the cold, I find, and all night. And, um, this is the um, this is the, the system I've got, I've got set up in Spain, and it's just a, a very brief uh, clip showing you um, it uh, as it's moving to the park position. So you get to see both sides of it. So the uh, two six-inch refractors, uh, it's a 10 micron GM2000 mount, and I have a twin QSI 6120 uh, CCD cameras on it. And also there are you know, automatic uh, robotic focuses and other gizmos. So um, I can, in fact, I've programmed that for tonight. I did it before I set off for Edinburgh today. And at 10 o'clock, the roof will open and it will automatically start imaging, hopefully. It, it did last night and it does, well, it's been doing it every night for quite a few years. Occasionally something goes wrong, but not often. Um, so, uh, so with that capability, I became very you know, attractive to people who wanted their possible discoveries imaged. Uh, I have to say that there are a lot of researchers who thought they found something two years ago and they've yet to get anybody to take a photograph of it. Um, I'm we're actually taking a photograph of one at the moment. Um, I don't know how long it's, the guy's been waiting for it, but it's, um, it's a few years. So there aren't that many resources available to do deep imaging, as you would expect, whereas there are literally hundreds of potential candidates. Uh, but until somebody takes a photograph, nobody knows what's there. Um, I, um, once I started doing imaging for researchers, um, I, as I say, I became very popular, and I was soon getting requests from all over the world, literally from India, the US, France, Germany, and here in the UK. Um, so uh, it was becoming uh, more and more of an activity for me, and it's effectively become a full-time activity. Um, once, uh, once I've taken an image, that's not the end of it, though. Um, we need to do a lot more before we know that it's a planetary nebula. Um, others have to review it, approve it, confirm that they think it is one. Then we have to get a spectrum taken. Until we know exactly what the chemical composition is, we can't be sure. There are a lot of planetary nebulae which have been proven not to be, and have been had to be uh, taken off the lists of other catalogs. Equally, there are a lot of things which have been um, in catalogs like the Sharpness catalog, which were thought not to be planetary nebulae. Um, and we've now discovered that some of them are. So it's not a trivial exercise to know that you've got a planetary nebula. Um, now, three years ago, there were two very um, productive uh, researchers, amateur researchers, one in France and one in Germany, uh, these two gentlemen here. And uh, they decided to team up together. And that was, I think, almost exactly three years ago. And they already had catalogs where they'd individually made several discoveries, but they decided to team together. And shortly after that, they uh, made their first joint discovery. And they contacted me to see if I would be kind enough to take a photograph of it. Um, knowing that these guys are considered gods in this business, I was flattered that they, um, they, they asked me. So I, I took the, the um, fo first photograph of their joint discoveries. Um, now, we've been working together ever since, and I spent most of my time imaging for, for these guys. I, you know, there are others as well. But these are the most productive, uh, prolific discoverers I've ever heard of. They, since three years ago, they made 160 discoveries, which works out at more than one every week on average, um, which is phenomenal. Now, those are discoveries which may still need to be, some of them may need to be uh, imaged even. Some may need to be confirmed through spectrum, but they're all uh, candidate planetary nebulae. Um, so the process they go through is, um, is to identify a candidate. First, they have to check nobody else has found it. So you look in the catalogs, is there already one there? And there'll be many occasions when somebody's got all excited that they found something, 
Uh, it's even happened to me. And then you discover, oh, no, somebody has already found it and it's already registered. So you don't get the credit for it. Um, there is um, there's a, a convention that if you find one of these, it is named based on the first two letters of your surname. Um, if there are two people find, jointly find, uh, finding it, then the first two letters of both surnames are concatenated. So Marcel Drexler, for example, his initial discoveries he made on his own all have DR1, DR2, DR3. And Xavier Strotner, they are ST1, ST2, ST3. Uh, for their joint discoveries, they are ST, DR1, 2, 3, and 4. Um, so um, what I'd like to do is now show you one example of, um, of how this process goes. So I've taken their 140th uh, discovery. <clears throat> this was, um, they contacted me, I think it was Christmas of last year on this. And um, this is what they started off with. Um, there's two images from these surveys. They're inverted so that you can make out um, the data, the image detail more clearly. And on the left-hand one, uh, those of you with good eyesight might make out a faint arc. And on the right-hand one, those of you with good eyesight might make out a faint blob. Um, I always maintain that um, a prerequisite for doing this is having a vivid visual imagination. Um, and so they asked me to photograph this. And some 74 hours and 35 minutes later, uh, we had that. Um, a rather beautiful and unusual one in that it is, is perfectly spherical. Um, so um, that's basically what I now do most of my time is uh, imaging with these guys. We're in daily contact with each other. Every night the telescopes are, are imaging something for them. Now, um, back in the spring of this year, um, near my telescopes, a dome appeared magically one night. And I discovered that it was, um, it was owned by a Swedish amateur astronomer called Sven Eklund. And this is his dome that secretly appeared one night. My telescopes are just a few meters away uh, off to the right there. Um, and he's got a C14 edge in there, which is also robotic. And Sven contacted me just after he got it set up and he, he'd seen what I was doing and he, he asked if there's any chance that he could get involved and, and join in. Um, we spent a few weeks figuring out some of the technical aspects of how do we, uh, uh, very different equipment, different cameras, how do we align them? How do we uh, get similar field of view, similar rotation and so on. Um, but uh, as a result of that, we now have three telescopes running every night, all on the same target. Um, and uh, so, for example, last night, I went, we've got astronomical darkness at 10 o'clock in Spain, uh, and that finished at 7 o'clock this morning. So we had three telescopes each doing nine hours. So we did 20, 27 hours of imaging last night. And uh, we... Uh, Pretty much what we do most nights now. Um, so it's quite easy to quickly uh, accumulate a lot of data. And Sven's a good guy because he takes on all of the work of calibrating, processing, and integrating hundreds of hours of data every week. Um, and I'm very grateful for him for doing all of the hard work so that I can just take it easy. Um, so uh, that's basically what we, um, we do. Um, what I'd like to do now is um, share with you um, some of the results. Um, I asked Marcel to put together a short video for this presentation of some of his favorite and most beautiful images. Um, so I'll, I'll now play that. Some of these are not taken by me. He's, um, Marcel has a team of astrophotographers around the world. Um, he needs some people with telescopes with fairly wide field of view. He needs some with a very, very small field of view and very long focal length. He needs some in the Northern Hemisphere and some in the Southern Hemisphere. So Marcel, he's now got, I think, about 10 
uh, photographers that do this. And he chooses the right ones based on what equipment they've got and, and so on. Uh, I guess we're sort of mid-range in terms of field of view here, but we also have the advantage that we've got an awful lot of telescope horsepower that we can throw at the very faint images. So um, uh, I'll now play this video. Um, I will not speak so that you can just enjoy the video. Marcel's put together some music to go with it, which hopefully will come out. Yes, it will. You will see some of these are not planetary nebulae. And you'll see some are still waiting to have a spectrum taken before they can be confirmed.
I don't know how many times I've watched that. Um, it's always, and that was, by, that was just a selection of what was discovered over 18 months. Um, there's a lot more that you haven't seen. Um, but every time I look at that, I'm amazed at how much beauty there is in the cosmos that has been waiting to be discovered. And I'm left wondering what will we be seeing in 18 months time? Um, well, actually, I, I, there are one or two that I can't show you yet because they're still not confirmed, but um, there are some equally beautiful ones coming down the pipeline. Yeah. Um, and it, yes, there's just so much up there that we've never ever seen because we haven't looked hard enough. Okay, now I, I mentioned that we, um, we're nearly all amateurs. There is one professional um, in what we consider to be the team, and this is Quentin Parker. Um, Quentin is the um, professional astrophysicist. He's, he leads the team that approves all planetary nebulae. Um, he decides whether it really is one or is not. Um, we go through the process of imaging, getting a spectrum. When we think it's, it's all good, we send it to him and then he either they give the thumbs up or they give the thumbs down. Uh, and he maintains a repository of all known planetary nebulae. Um, so we're very grateful for Quentin's um, involvement and uh, he works very closely with us. Uh, there was um, one occasion, um, one of these images, we discovered it, well, it, we suspect we'd found it late December. Um, uh, Marcel and Xavier contacted me. Uh, that evening I started imaging it. Uh, within a week, I think we had enough data to um, have a photograph of it. Um, then we um, managed to get a spectrum produced and eventually managed to get the, all of the results to Quentin. And within, I think it was with, certainly within a month, maybe three weeks, we went from the initial discovery to it being formally confirmed as a, a new planetary nebula. Normally that takes years, um, but because we've, um, we've got a great team all working together, um, that's um, enabling us to move a lot faster. Now, you know, Quentin, he's a professor at the University of Hong Kong, um, and he's the director of the uh, Laboratory of Space Research there. Um, if you want to know more than I've been able to cover today, and he produced uh, in August an excellent paper, a planetary nebulae and how to find them a concise review. Um, I wish he'd written this two years earlier because um, it's, um, it's been hard work learning without um, something like this to um, uh, as an introduction. And it's not too technical. And I think most amateur astronomers would find it quite easy to, to follow and to understand. Um, he also um, was given an award, a Gemini Award this year, issued by the, um, the French equivalent of the um, Royal Astronomical Society for his collaboration with amateurs in the area of planetary nebulae and, and the team that we're, we're, we're all part of. Um, within that, uh, that document, he acknowledges the contribution that amateurs are making. Um, and I was very pleased to so we see that he'd selected two of my images as illustrations. Um, so yes, he says, the amateur community is making use of dedicated small aperture telescopes to perform very deep narrowband imaging, um, taken in some cases over dozens of hours. He then goes on to say that these provide unprecedented high quality uh, deep imaging, rivaling and in many cases surpassing the best professional images. So we may not have very, very big telescopes, but we do have the, the luxury of a lot of time um, and a lot of imaging time. And, uh, and, and so it's very, very rewarding to see that he'd, um, he'd chosen those. Um, right now, I'd like to close really by just acknowledging you know, the key members of the team. There are, there, are, there are others around, but I mean, Marcel and Xavier, these are the guys that find everything. If they didn't find anything, I'd have nothing to photograph. So I'm very, very grateful to them. Uh, Dana Patrick is um, a remarkable amateur in that he has been doing this for 20 years. I think he's probably found more than any other. And he's, um, he's given me some good um, targets to image. And I've even got my name on, on a couple of them. And he's um, got a vast experience. Um, here in the UK, there's a guy called Sakib Rasul, who's an amateur, but he's probably more knowledgeable than many professionals in the area of, of planetary nebulae. And he gives me a 
constant stream of suggestions for things to photograph, um, including one two days ago, um, and another email yesterday. Um, Pascal Ledoux, he leads the um, French amateur community, and it's a very active community of French amateurs. And before any amateur discovery gets registered, he has to approve it. So we send him the image, we send him the information we've got, and he'll take a look at it and he'll decide whether it's worth registering. And if it does, then you know, we got a name on it and nobody else can steal it from us. Um, he then is very helpful in securing uh, um, spectrum of the target. By the way, the image is necessary in order to produce the spectrum. You can't, just the coordinates is not enough because you've got to figure out where do you put the slit so that you get the oxygen and the hydrogen alpha and you, you get a representative spectrum covering the, the whole object. So he'll take the image and he'll then, he's got a bunch of guys in France who do spectroscopy. And there's also a small group of them who have now established um, a dual rig uh, robotic spectroscopy capability in Chile uh, at a remote site there. So we're getting more and more capacity for doing this. Um, Quentin, I mentioned, um, without him, you know, we would never ever get anything actually formally confirmed and um, blessed. And he's um, he, he's essential member of the team. And I and I, Sven has increased our imaging capacity by fifty percent. Um, so one illustration of that: in the, um, Midsummer's Day, we get six hours of darkness in Spain. Uh, with my two telescopes and his, we did 18 hours of dark sky imaging on Midsummer's Day. I bet you don't do that in Scotland. Um, <laughs> and he does all, as I said, all of the hard work of integrating all of the data. He, um, I send it, well, I've got to him every morning. Um, a few hours later, he sends me an image back. And, um, and then eventually when we've got enough, um, then it's all consolidated and... Um, and we start the whole process again. So I'm very grateful to all of these guys. This is not anything that one person could do, um, but it's also, I'm, I'm impressed. And I like the fact that it's such an international group. Okay, thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Peter. That was, that was fascinating and some amazing, beautiful images there. Um, I, yeah, I think a Midsummer's Day in Scotland, you, you, you don't get any darkness for several, several weeks after that. No, in England. <laughs> no, that's right, yeah. Um, I have to, the cameras questions, we'll have questions in the hall first and questions on Zoom. You can put your name in the chat there. And if you've got time, um, Will will read out any questions you can put on the, the YouTube chat if you, if you have any. So is there anyone in the hall? Yeah. Um, just a few. Um, What's a is there a typical angular size for these objects? Um, is, is there a typical angular size for these objects? No, there isn't. Um, you, the, the very brightest planetary nebulae, for the reasons I explained earlier, tend to be very small because effectively it starts as soon as the shell is ejected um, from the star. And at that point, the white dwarf is at its most brightest, its most intense uh, and highest intensity. So, but those are, uh, very, very small. You're talking about uh, a few arc seconds. And many of the ones that haven't been photographed and are because they're just too small and nobody's got the focal length to do it. So there are hundreds which are um, five arc seconds, 10 arc seconds, but then there are others which are several arc minutes. So it, I, I don't know. I've not done a statistical, statistical analysis. The ones that I do, we do, tend to fall in the range of a few art minutes. Why twin scopes instead of one larger one? Because I couldn't afford a 12 inch refractor. Um, I did look at the price, but it came in at about 280,000 pounds just for the lens. Um, uh, so, yes, yeah, so I, I wanted more capacity and uh, I, I like, I have a preference for refractors. I've always had a refractor since the beginning. Six, even a six inch, Refractor, the lens for that runs up to a few thousand pounds. So uh, cost is a limiting factor in terms of refractor size. Um, and so it's, it was easier to just to buy another one and I could just about afford that. So uh, I was greedy in terms of 
imaging time rather than focal length, I guess. And the filters that you use? Yeah, I use um, Astrodon filters. Um, the oxygen three filter is uh, three nanometers. The hydrogen is five nanometers. And then there's um, sulfur at five nanometers and then RGB. Okay. Any other questions from the, the hall? You have Neil here. Yeah, that was fascinating and amazing um, images. And I agree with you about the, the beauty of the cosmos. Um, my question is about the unknown images. How are we going to classify those? Uh, well, yes, the uh, so, um, some of these things are just so weird. I know I think two, two or three in that, in that video. Um, we don't know how to classify them. And we've involved professional astronomers in this. At the end of the day, we always involve a professional. Uh, for supernova remnant, there's uh, an astronomer who, um, who advises on those and Quentin does for planetary nebulae. If it's something that nobody can quite figure out what it is, then it just remains that. And uh, there's, uh, there's nobody we can know who we can go to to give us the answer. Well, I've got one question though. Um, you're spending a lot of time, um, hundred and many hours doing the images and you've got beautiful images out of it. We get a couple of us doing really well. Is that me? Yeah. Okay. Are, the, are these objects um, achievable during the couple of hours? Uh, not very pretty pictures, but could we capture them during those times? Um, yeah, that, 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 that's a... And from Edinburgh. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, if you get dark skies and um, and no clouds, then uh, they, they could be imaged from here. The uh, Some of these, I mean, they're all pretty faint. Uh, you could, if you've got one that's on the brighter side of faint rather than the fainter side of faint, then with a couple of hours, uh, you might be able to get, get something. I'm, actually, no, I'm being a bit too negative there. Um, Often, even with one 15 minute exposure, I can see an outline of something. I can see that there's something there. And um, like last night, I look at each frame and each frame I can see the image there. And would you stack a few, clearly it gets a lot, lot clearer. So yeah, a couple of hours, it should be possible. Um, but some of the really brutally faint ones, yeah, you'd, um, mm -hmm. you're having a hope in hell. But uh, as I say, that extreme one, 190 hours, I think we did over 100 hours of 03. And for a long time, we didn't know whether there was anything there. And uh, in fact, Sven, uh, his nickname is Sven the Skeptical because he kept saying, there's nothing here, there's nothing here. Yeah. And he was doing the 03 imaging. So uh, he did um, 100 or over 100 hours. And even towards the end, he said, I'm still skeptical, there's nothing there. But um, Marcel has a remarkable talent for processing very, very faint images. Um, he uses some really good techniques. Uh, I joke that all he needs is about three or four photons to produce a beautiful, beautiful image like that. Um, I think I'm exaggerating a bit, but um, it requires, if, the, if it's really, really faint, you do need a lot of data. But no, um, 15 minutes, you can produce something if it's, uh, if it's not an unreasonable one. Yeah, okay. You must get dust and insects and the like on your telescopes. Does somebody in Spain look after them? For you? Yes, yes. I'm um, the the site we're at. It's um, I, I I nickname it a telescope hotel. Uh, I think they've got seventy six robotic telescopes there, um, and over quite a large sort of area. And the um, they've got two on site engineers there every day, um, and yeah, we've got to know them very very well. It's it's. One thing to be able to go to your back garden and have a look and hit it with a hammer or reconnect a USB cable or whatever you need to do if there's a problem. It's very frustrating when you're sitting a thousand miles away and it's something's gone wrong in the middle of the night and you can't look at it and you can't figure out um, what's wrong. But um, these guys are very good. They're very responsive. And uh, they're obviously with 76 telescopes to look after. They've also got a lot of experience. So um, luckily, um, you know, we have to try and figure out what might be wrong and then guide them in terms of what to go and look after or, or check. But they're very good. They clean, they clean the glass on the lenses uh, when needed. And um, so, uh, yeah, without that, it'll be hopeless because uh, 
you know, things do go wrong. Um, for example, and I'll, I'll list all the things that have gone wrong. Right, power cut. Um, internet cable gets cut through. There's a very good fiber optic cable, but it goes, uh, we're um, five kilometers from the nearest village town and it's all farming. So farmers like digging JCBs through fiber optic cables. So um, you lose that. Um, so there's quite, imagine everything that could go wrong. Um, there's a power failure. The roof is still open. Um, a thunderstorm that wasn't predicted arrives, which you know, triggers another power failure. And uh, you've got tens of thousands of pounds worth of equipment in a field thousand miles away uh, and there's nobody there at night time by the way so um, so yeah luckily the system is fairly uh, fail safe um, there are backup batteries everywhere uh, backup batteries for the roof so that it will automatically close so if the internet goes down if the power goes down if the pc crashes even um, it will still be okay because the roof system will um, make sure that the mount parks and it'll then close the roof, even if the PC goes dead. So it's um, some some impressive technology there, which has been well refined to keep me sleeping properly at night. The Zoom questions now. Yeah, we've got one question from our Zoom audience from Douglas, uh, and it is uh, spec spectroscopy. Who does it, and what is involved in terms of equipment, aperture, and exposure? Oh gosh, I'm not a spectroscopy expert. Uh, there are um, four or five guys in France who do the spectroscopy for us. Uh, one, they have an observatory, a new observatory uh, down um, in the Vontu area, and others have got um, scopes where they've got a spec um, a spectroscope at the back of them uh, around France. And we've also got, as I say, two now remotely and robotically in Chile. Um, for the ones I'm familiar with, um, it's, I think they're four, five inch scopes, um, but, but I'm, I'm, I'm guessing. Um, and so I'm, I'm not familiar with the, the specs of the equipment that they use, but it's obviously quite varied. Um, what I found is that um, I'm part of this group in Hampshire and uh, they've got a 24 inch scope in a dome with, and, with, and they stick a spectroscope on the back of it. And I've tried using that a few times, but the problem we've got there is um, either we can't get low enough on the horizon um, or the light pollution is, is just too much or the signal's too faint. Um, getting a spectrum of very, very faint objects obviously requires you know, a fairly long exposure. So again, you need dark skies, you need um, you know, good weather, um, and um, pretty good equipment. Thank you. We've got one more from, from Sarah. Uh, how about the names of the objects? You mentioned about the initials from the discoverers, but how are the names given? And Sarah noticed that one of them was a, a strange object. Um, well, the, 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 um, the registration is based upon the initials of the discoverers. Um, I think the strange one, I think there were three uh, pairs of initials go there but we're also uh we take turns in being given um a, a more familiar name just as many astronomical objects and not just ngc xyz but they've got a, a, a more um consumable name so we take turns on that and um the uh, for example um marcel asked me for a name for that that um stdr one i think it was one one four one um and I said, look, it looks like a wine glass to me. So we said, okay, we'll call it the wine glass nebula. Uh, but you know, we, we take turns and you can name it over after your, um, your wife, your husband, your girlfriend, your lover, um, your dog, um, what, what, you know, whatever you, you want. To, um, so there's, um, it, it's really all free for each of us to take turns in coming up with a name. It's a YouTube question, sir. A fantastic uh, talk there, Peter. Breathtaking images. Um, really appreciated by all. Um, got one question from AC. Is there a published repository of these images? Um, there's a published repository of these images. Uh, yes, there are. There are two official repositories, if you like. There's the, there's the, Quentin Parker maintains um, 
a thing called a hash database and it's um it's accessible to everybody it tends to be more on the scientific side and it lists every known plant in nebula um you can search on it uh, by either the proper name or uh, or the coordinates and it will show you what if there's a spectrum and it'll show you whatever data is available for that and it will contain a link to an image but it won't normally contain the image itself uh, for the uh, i mentioned that pascal ledoux in france maintains um, a website of all amateur discoveries it's called planetarynebulae.net uh, it's available in french and in english and he puts up on there whatever images are available for each amateur discovery that he has registered um, so you'll find uh you'll find most amateur images there uh, the other place of course you can look at is my website uh, imagingdeepspace.com i put all of the ones that i've done uh, or collaborated on in there and the the fourth source is at astrobin.com we tend to put all of our images up on astrobin some of you will be familiar with that i guess and uh, so that's uh, a repository for all sorts of amateur images, not just the planetary nebulae that we do. Right. And um, just just a final little question. I'm just intrigued. Whereabouts in Spain is your setup? Okay, um, Have you been it's there? it's about uh, hundred and fifty kilometers northwest of Seville, uh, towards the Portuguese border. It's in um, what is technically defined as a desert. Um, the nearest town village is a place called Fregonel de la Sierra, uh, but where the observatory is, there is only one light bulb visible to the horizon, and that's a, um, a religious uh, retreat. So um, it's, you know, it's quite remote. You drive through um, a forest. It's an oak forest. All the forest there, all the land there, are natural wild Spanish oak forests. And underneath you get the black pigs that eat all the acorns, and that's where the really, really nice Spanish ham comes from. Pardon? Is it Trevinka? Uh, I don't understand Trevinka. Oh, no, no, it's not there, no. It, this is called um, E-Y-E. Um, it's, um, it's Spanish for between the oaks and the stars. Um, and so if you, yeah, it's, it's EYE, and it's the largest hosting site uh, in Europe now for, for telescopes. Thank you. I think that's all the questions. Um, thank you very much again. Thank you for your talk. You're very welcome. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna, um, the short um, switch over. Um, Sarah is going to give us the sky in September. Um, I'm sure we're doing that remotely, so um, just give us a second. Are you good to go, Sarah? Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, hopefully everybody can hear me. Um, okay, so this is the sky for September. Okay, so just to start with, um, I want to highlight hours this month. So um, at the beginning of this month, um, we have the sunrise. Um, it's around about now, we're looking at about half past six. Um, then looking at the, uh, the effective darkness, which is the nautical twilight, we're looking at about half past nine, 2136 for this to be precise from the beginning of the month. Tonight, it's about quarter past nine. Um, and then leading in into October will be 
about 10 past eight. So we're, we're getting um, more and more darkness as we go along, which is, which is great for, for us. Um, in terms of the phases of the moon, um, on the 3rd of September, this was the moon at the first quarter. Um, and then actually tomorrow we have the full moon, so harvest moon. Um, at this point, the moon is 14 days old. Um, and then we have um, the new moon. Um, September. Um, okay, so um, I just wanted to provide uh, a snapshot here, just from this is how Jupiter's probably been looking for a while now. Um, but on um, the 11th, um, Your sound is cutting out quite a bit, Sarah. Okay. okay. Um, apologies, I'm just going to try and move my screen. Okay. Can you hear me okay now? No, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so um, again, this is the, the 9th of September. Um, so for um, from Edinburgh, we have Jupiter is, is accessible, as I said about it. it's about quarter past nine, which is when we have the effective darkness. And this is when it reaches an altitude of Reeves of the eastern horizon. Um, and then it will reach its highest point at about 2.23 a.m., 34 degrees above the southern horizon. So this is tonight. So this is just to get an idea of um, what it's like tonight. So then moving on to Sunday, we actually have um, the conjunction of the moon and Jupiter. This is um, when the pair will, um, so moon and Jupiter will share the same right ascension. So the moon will be passing one degree 48 minutes to the south of Jupiter. So as you can see, we have quite a different alignment going on here. And this will be quite an interesting um, uh, um, vision to look at through, um, not through a telescope, but um, visually with our with the naked eye, as well as binoculars, perhaps. But um, for any of you that like taking pictures um, just of the night sky, I know Fran, Fran Goodman quite often does this. This will be great for just uh, photography. Um, both the Ju Jupiter and the moon will also make a close approach, which is also called an appulse. And this is when two or more astronomical objects appear close to one another in the sky. So from Edinburgh, um, the pair will be accessible about 2108 on the 11th, um, to be precise. Um, they've, when, this is when they reach an altitude of about seven degrees above the eastern horizon. And then they'll reach their highest point in the sky at about 2.14 um, a.m. And that'll be 34 degrees above the southern horizon. So sticking with Jupiter now, um, but moving towards the end of the month, we actually have um, Jupiter opposition. So for those of you that have um, been reading um, Alan's Sky Diary, um, I think the brightest it's been in 166 years. So this will be um, quite a spectacle to look at. So it reaches opposition on the right of the sun and the sky, and it's lined with these floating horizons. Um, so it will be visible for much of the night um, and reaching the highest point around midnight. Um, and at the same time, so looking at this diagram here, um, Jupiter, so at the same time that Jupiter is passing opposition, it also makes its closest approach to the Earth, um, as you can see. So it will be in its, uh, what is known as perigee, um, and looking 
as I said, very bright and large. So this is um, just a kind of visual representation of a comparison between um, Jupiter at a solar conjunction and what the size difference with Jupiter at its opposition. So um, keeping with the planets, but this time uh, moving to Uranus, um, on the 14th of September, we have what is known as a lunar occultation of Uranus. Um, this is when um, a celestial object passes in front of another, blocking it from view. And this event is the moon that will pass in front of the And we have the times here as well. So the disappearance of Uranus um, will be um, at 22.38. And um, it will be gone for roughly just under an hour, um, appearing again at uh, 2327. Um, so uh, let me have a look. I was just going to give you a bit more information. So the, um, the uh, an occultation is usually visible. It's not visible from every part of, it's only visible from a fraction of the Earth's surface. And in this case, it's actually visible from parts of Africa, Asia, and Europe. Um, so, moving on to the next planet. Oh, and I think I'm just showing you here. Um, this is what it will look like in the sky. So, um, if you can see it, this is in the Taurus. Where the moon is. Um, this Again, is what... Sarah, I think. You okay. Yeah, you keep dropping out sometimes. I think. I think when you're you're speaking loudly, it, it stays um, it stays on. But I think if you go quieter, it sometimes um, stops broadcasting. So but carry on. Okay, on. I'll try and uh, speak louder. <laughs> um, okay, so um, yeah, this is just to show you if you didn't catch it that it was just where Uranus will be in the sky. Um, looking northeast, east um, um, of Taurus, um, and obviously uh, where the moon is. So this is why it's kind of over overlapping here on Stellarium. Now moving on to the next planet is Neptune at opposition. So it's just as Jupiter in the, in the same same way, um, Jupiter is at opposition on the twenty sixth. We have Neptune at opposition on the 16th of September. Um, obviously, much, much smaller um, object we're looking at here. And um, you can't really see it on here on, at the moment, but if we zoom in, um, this is where we're looking at Neptune. So it's, um, it's very close to the, or within, maybe considered within the uh, constellation of Aquarius. Um, so again, it will reach opposition when it lies opposite the sun. So if you remember that diagram I, I showed for Jupiter, um, it lies within the constellation of Aquarius. It will be visible again for much of the night, reaching its highest point around midnight. So um, from Ed Edinburgh, it will be visible about half past 10, um, 21 degrees southeast. And... Um, and then disappearing about 352 um, at 21 degrees southwest, or at its, sorry, at its highest point, I think, at that point. Okay, so we also have a conjunction of the Moon and Mars. So um, thinking about the alignment of um, We also have a similar thing going on with the Moon and Mars. Um, and th this is again when they'll share the same right ascension uh, with the Moon passing three degrees, uh, 36 out minutes to the north of Mars. At this point, the Moon will actually be about 21 days old. Um, and they will also make um, an a pulse, which is this close approach. Um, uh, again, as I think I mentioned for Jupiter, will not you'll not be able to see this alignment um, or the, the two together down down a telescope, of course. But it's a 
much more kind of visual um, thing to see with the eye and um, maybe a good photography opportunity. Um, so from Edinburgh, the pair will be visible from about um, 11 o'clock and they reach an altitude of about seven degrees above the northeast horizon. And then they'll reach their highest point at about 620 um, at 55 degrees above the south. So um, also throughout this month, um, we actually have one party shower. Um, this is active from the 5th to the 21st of September, so it's already happening. And actually the peak rate of meteors is actually tonight. So if you have the opportunity to get out there tonight um, and be looking up, um, you know, not, tonight is the night apparently. Um, so uh, there'll be a chance um, of seeing the meteors um, whenever the showers radiant point um, is in the constellation of uh, Perseus. Um, so I'm not sure how much you can see from this diagram, but it's just the, the idea of um, th this is uh, representing the radiant point on which the, the shower is um, coming out of. Um, and this is when it's above the horizon. So, um, from Edinburgh, the radiant point is second polar, and that means it's always above the horizon um, and it's active throughout the night. And um, the, the number of visible meteors increase um, with the higher the radiant point in the sky. Um, from Edinburgh, the radiant of the shower will appear at a peak altitude of about 74 degrees above the horizon. Um, and it's estimated that you may be able to see up to about four me meteors per hour um, at the shower's peak. So I'm not sure how exactly that compares to previous ones um, we've had, but um, that's what, what we should look out for if we can. So, um, on the 23rd of September, this is marking the first day of autumn, so it's the autumnal equinox. So it's the first day of autumn in the Northern Hemisphere um, with the first day of spring in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, the word equinox is derived from Latin and it means um, equal, equus, equal and nox, night. Um, and this is when the sun's crossing from north to south and the hours of daylight and darkness are at their most equal on this day. Um, so from this point onwards, we'll begin to have uh, longer hours of darkness. And um, so this diagram is just to show the celestial equator. So it's when the, the sun is um, it's taking its annual journey through the constellations and it's cutting across the celestial equator and it's halfway across. Um, and again, that's why we have the um, half, exactly 12 hours of day and night on this, on the 23rd. So just to finish now with um, some of the, uh, just what, what to look out for in um, um, the different, um, different directions um, and uh, more deep It's there. Um, I've started here from the 23rd um, simply because it was the equinox We've got more hours of darkness. Um, also, don't forget on the 25th, we have the, the harvest moon as well. Um, so, uh, again, um, that's to our advantage as well. Um, so, just looking north here, um, I'm not going to go into any detail on, on this part, but we, as you can see, we've got. Um, the SA major constellation, SA minor, um, Capella is here, which is um, the brightest star in Aurigia, um, which is the sixth brightest star in the sky. These are kind of um, what we'd be familiar with. Um, 
looking west, we also have the two bright stars, Alta and Vega, um, Hercules being a key constellation looking west. Um, Vega is actually the fifth brightest star in all. Of course, yeah, these are kind of key uh, markers as well uh, for looking for various objects in the sky. Um, looking east, I just wanted to point out um, the going further into the constellation of Taurus, which is, again, it's an, an area that we'd be all familiar with. Anyway, I guess it's just as a reminder or to highlight that this uh, this we can we can now start looking at these um, these objects. So moving into Taurus, um, looking east, um, Pleiades here, which is um, a, a star cluster that we would be familiar with um, looking at, um, and you can see this with the naked eye even, it's obviously not in detail, but um, you can actually pick this out. Um, and uh, it's one of the nearest star clusters um, to the Earth. Um, and it's an open star cluster, which is dominated by hot blue and luminous stars that formed about 75 to 150 million years ago. Um, and, and it's, other names are obviously um, M45 or Seven Sisters. Um, so the, um, the brightest um, stars all get their names from Greek mythology um, and they're just labeled here. I don't know how much you can see from afar, but um, we have uh, Alcyone, Atlas, Electra, Maya, Merope, Tegeta, Cleone. I don't know whether I'm pronouncing them right, but um, there's also their parents there as well, but they're not actually labelled. But there's a lot of stars there. They're just the kind of ones that people normally pick out. Um, Pleiades, the, the actual name comes from ancient Greek, I believe. It's um, most likely from um, the, def, uh, the translation, which is Pline. Um, sorry, Pline, which translates to, um, to sail. So I think um, it's it's got a connection with sailing in the Mediterranean Sea, so it was used possibly as a guide, um, given that you can actually see it with the naked eye. Um, we also have Hyades here as well, which I'm not going to go into um, detail with, but um, this is obviously uh, another um, area to look at. We have... Um, the, the stars, the bright stars form a V with um, Aldebaran, um, which is considered to be the eye of the bull in Taurus. Um, the Aldebaran actually has no connection with Heidi's star cluster at all. It's part of the, the Taurus constellation, but they just happen to, to be in alignment um, there with each other. But the brightest stars on Taurus, in Taurus, form along the V-shape. Um, and they're also um, interesting ones to look at. Um, Pat Divine, which is quite a nice um, image of Pleiades. Um, and just, um, just to finish now, um, and going into um, a constellation that I'm sure we're all quite familiar with, uh, because I know that um, people have talked about it before. But um, again, just to refresh ourselves, um, to remind ourselves about the, uh, the different um, objects. So this is just looking from Stellarium. We can see, um, obviously, Aquarius, and we've got the planets there as well. Um, again, this is looking from the 23rd of September, so uh, all of these have been from the equinox. Um, but remembering also that we have the new moon on the 25th. Um, so just going above, um, moving above Aquarius. Um, so 
This is now moving above Aquarius and higher up in the sky, we have the constellation of Cygnus here. Um, and uh, this uh, Cygnus represents the swan. And uh, we have Deneb there, which is actually um, the brightest star in that constellation. Um, Moving in again, just this is just obviously a, um, a pretty uh, visual of this as the swan. And um, just wanted to highlight these objects around here. So we have the open cluster as well, M39. And um, then I was um, following. Um, just kind of looking at the, the the astronomy calendar from the Royal Observatory, and they had pointed out these objects as um, objects that would be good to look at from the the twenty fifth, the new moon. So um, this is why I'm highlighting them here. But of course, we're probably quite familiar with some of these. Um, so Mark has before viewed and imaged the M thirty nine. This is. Um, Um, and it's about, well, about 30 stars. I'm not sure where, whether that's exact, but it lies about 800 light years away. Um, this is the Firework Galaxy, NGC 6946. Um, this is a picture from Ian. Um, You lost you again, Sarah. Okay. Can you hear me now? No, thank you. Um, and here we have a picture of the um, present nebula, which is 688 on Pat. Um, I didn't actually, um, so what is interesting is um, we've had this talk on planetary nebula. Um, so um, NGC 6826 is a planetary nebula. So it's actually the, also known as a Coldwell 15. Um, and I didn't actually pull in an image here for this. I didn't easily find one. Um, I'm not sure if anybody, any of our images have actually looked at this. I feel like we, somebody may have done, because I may have seen it before, but it's actually a very beautiful um, nebula as um as our presenter has just uh, talked about they're very pretty and um it's definitely worth taking a look at it's called the blinking planetary nebula um so when viewed through a small telescope um, the brightness of the central star overwhelms the eye so um this obscures the surrounding nebula now that this might be a reason why it's maybe not as favorable to look at i'm not sure um but it can be viewed while well using averted vision, um, which causes it to blink in and out of view as the observer's eye wanders. So it's um, definitely worth, um, it's obviously the one I've, I've not added here and I wish I had found an image for it to add because it's, it's, um, it's very, very beautiful. So definitely worth, definitely worth anybody taking a look. Um, and that, I think, is it. I'm sorry that if you couldn't hear some of that. <laughs> Most of that, Sarah, thanks very much.